Reading the Hearts of People In many Eastern cultures, face reading is an ancient art form wherein a person's character and even nature of their soul is thought to be determined based on the reading of the minute details that make up a face. However, this idea did not really exist in France until the mid-17th century, and really came on the scene with the advent of Descartes' treatise, The Passions of the Soul. As we've mentioned before in this course, the passions, according to medieval thought, had composed the lowest part of the human soul. They were thought to be blind and needed to be well governed by one's imagination, which was in turn well governed by one's reason. The passions, if left unchecked, could run rampant and even destroy a person's free will. Love, of course, was one of these passions. In the court of law, if it could be demonstrated that a person was in love when they drew a contract, this evidence, usually presented in the form of love letters, would void the contract. In this period, undue influence could come from within. With Descartes, the religious discourse regarding the passions would slowly go away. He propounded a physiological rather than spiritual reading of the passions. Instead of considering them in terms of theology, the passions were looked at as a matter of pure natural philosophy. For example, Descartes reduced the shedding of tears due to heartbreak to a set of purely physiological reactions. For tears, sadness is first required because it chills all the blood and narrows the pores of the eyes. However, as the pores narrow, the sadness also diminishes the quantity of vapors that must pass through the pores. This would result in an insufficient amount of vapors for the production of tears if the quantity of these vapors were not at the same time augmented by another cause. And there is nothing that augments the vapors so much as the blood that is sent toward the heart due to the passions of love. It's not exactly the type of science we rely on today, but Louis XIV's official court painter, Charles Le Pont, took very seriously Descartes' argument from first principles, and in 1668 offered his Conférence Générale et Particulière, which translates to General and Particular Conference, it's just a weird, weird name, which gave detailed pictorial demonstrations of the passions based directly on Descartes' passional physiology. Lebrun's resulting science of expression took as foundational the Cartesian concept of the man-machine, which allowed him to reduce the expression of the passions to an index of nearly predictable formula. Each passion or emotion was accorded a prototype. The correlation of the passions to their physical manifestation was considered precise and direct, the proper understanding of which meant the informed viewer could determine the state of mind, or soul, of another person. Now let us look at some of Lebrun's works that best display the physiognomy that he was so interested in portraying. Here is one of his earlier works entitled The Sacrifice of Polixena. This work was only recently discovered. It was tucked away somewhere inside the Coco Chanel suite at the Paris Ritz Hotel. In the work, Lebrun is faithfully illustrating the text of Ovid's Metamorphoses for his depiction of the heroic Polyxena, daughter of King Priam of Troy, whose sacrifice was demanded by the ghost of Achilles. Here, after she refused to beg Odysseus for her life, thereby upholding her royal status, she is seen bearing her breast ready for the dagger. We can see that Lebrun is a good student of his master, Nicolas Poussin, with his handling of color and attention to historical accuracy. 
Yet if we zoom in on Polyxena's face, indeed all the faces, we notice a particular focus on physiognomy. Let's compare these faces with those in his master, Poussin. Nicolas Poussin had been very interested in the passions as well, but in terms of the classical hierarchy of the passions. Here we see in his second Rape of the Sabine Women, he seeks to produce a Romulus as governed not by the emotion of what is taking place below, the theft of the Sabine women by the Roman battalion, but rather in control of his passions. Reason, not feeling, governs him. Now let's look back at Lebrun's Polixena. She is still accorded the smooth, marble skin consonant with her status, but instead of unseeing eyes absorbed in her status as princess, we see pink-rimmed lids brimming with tears, not for her own sake, but that of her mother's, who frantically pleads for her innocent daughter's life. Her skin has taken on a ghostly pallor, signaling to the viewer the inner dread experienced by a body knowing its last breath is near. We see the shadow of death around the desperate mouth of Polixena's mother, Hecuba, who, though her eyes do not yet lament in the sight of her daughter, she knew the emptiness of her words. Now let's turn to a later Lebrun, painted around 1665, the entrance of Alexander, which now hangs in the Louvre along with three other paintings that together constitute a series representing the battles and triumphs of Alexander the Great. Unlike the previous painting, now we see Le Pont is under the employ of Louis XIV, and this is a propaganda piece like no other. Immediately prior to this painting, Louis XIV had consented to allow Le Pont to form the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, for which the artist would act as director. I think for this and so many reasons, Le Brun is often put in the propaganda drawer as a simple courtier who couldn't pay his way out of his own pocketbook. I think this is a bit unfair, firstly because this was how painters painted at the time. They either received commissions from their wealthy patrons and painted what they were told, or they painted something they hoped would spark the interest of their wealthy patron and prayed that it would be purchased. Le Pont was just the best at his time and under the patronage of a king in love with imagery. Moreover, as Le Pont was likely suggesting here, the progression of painting and other fine arts such as tapestry could only take place at this time under the grand, unifying, imperial projects of a monarch like Louis XIV, who threw his resources behind these endeavors and installed a new bank of political capital based on the patronage of French artists and art. For Le Brun, as for Poussin, this progress would take place only in the pictorial grammar of classical rhetoric, meaning by this the ancient Roman love of self-representation or self-fashioning. But this is less selfies and more Cicero. Cicero's theory on oratory was the major touchstone for Poussin's approach to painting. It required a noble action to display and then an appropriate handling. This is the height of the academic style. Alexander is shown entering Babylon in his elephant-drawn chariot. This was a special scene, for according to the historians, upon his entrance into Babylon, Alexander was met with the stunning beauty of the Persian women. And that is what this entrance is really about. It was reported by the Greek philosopher Plutarch that, quote, Alexander, considering the mastery of himself a more kingly thing than the conquest of his enemies, did not lay hands on these women. Le Brun's illustration thus is a formalization of gallantry, ratified as the moral code of nobility. The general opinion in 17th century France held that this was Alexander's most glorious victory because it was won over himself rather than his enemy and that a man who could command himself could command the nations of the world.